I've gotten to know Jose was through um, Friends Committee on National Legislation. I've really been impressed with his commitment to social justice and uh, and uh, really wanted to hear uh, more about what he was going to share today. So, um, and he comes from the Dominican Republic, which uh, I'm very interested in because Jill and I plan to visit there this summer. And um, I'm interested in what's happening uh, in that country as well. So Jose, <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you're, you're gonna share with us. <clears throat> Excuse me, thanks Anthony and Rick, really appreciate the invitation. Um, and the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I am first generation American. So um, I was born in New York City, but my parents were born and raised in the Dominican Republic. Um, my grandmother fled after uh, the dictatorship of Rafael Leonidas Trujillo. Um, it was a bloody uh, taking over of the government. In, I, I believe in 1967, um, he was assassinated, uh, but he was a pretty brutal dictator, um, committed tons of human rights abuses. Um, <clears throat> you would be disappeared if you disagreed or uh, publicly dissented against his authority. Um, and, and it was a pretty terrifying time. Um, that's why my grandmother fled um, to Puerto Rico. Uh, she uh, went from <clears throat> cleaning, no, she went from selling fried foods on the side of the road to cleaning hotels in Puerto Rico. Um, a pretty rich family uh, took to her um, and really, really liked her um, and helped her um, make it to New York. When um, my mother eventually joined her um in the 60s, probably probably 69, um, to where I grew up um, in New York City. I uh, was born and raised in Inwood, which is between the Washington Heights section of Manhattan and uh, the Bronx. And uh, it was quite a time. Um, drugs were pretty common. Um, we had the 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 leadership of our good mayor Rudolph Giuliani at the time. Um, so there was a lot of uh, cracking down, a lot of law enforcement, mass incarceration. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to start with um, human rights because, um, for me, that's always been an academic concept or a concept that's far away. Uh, the ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia what happened in Rwanda, something similar. It's always something that happens far, far away. <clears throat> we never get taught about um, how that happens in our own country. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to start with um, something that my mother always warned me about um, because we eventually moved to New Jersey. My mother was afraid that I would, uh, fall into a life of crime, um, even though the worst, and worst crime I ever committed as a kid was loitering. Um, we, we, we eventually moved to New Jersey. <clears throat> and she would always warn me when I was um, a junior, senior in high school, um, be very careful what car you get into. Um, you never know what could happen. There could be drugs in the car. You can be stopped by police. Um, and I... I'll, I I always thought that that was um, overblown. Nothing's going to happen. Um, I don't do drugs. Um, but <clears throat> she explained to me that I can be pulled over and anything in that car, I could be found guilty of doing. Um, my mother was not an attorney. She's not an attorney. She's an accountant. Uh, her profession is numbers. <clears throat> but it was... It's shocking to me today that what she was doing was explaining to me uh, what criminal conspiracy was. Anything that would have happened in that car, I could have been found guilty and liable of, and I could have been sent to prison for whatever was in that car. A gun, drugs, you never know. Um, and <clears throat> think back to growing up in New York, um, one, of, one, of my, one of my friends um, eventually did... <clears throat> 
get um, prosecuted and incarcerated for drugs. Um, and and I always think back to that because we were we were pretty much the same. Both of our parents came from the, from the, from the Dominican Republic. We play basketball in the same neighborhood. We were in the same circles. I just happen to have a stronger um, support system, and I I I never fell into that. But it could have very easily happened to me. Um, and then if we look at <clears throat> the whole picture, um, at any given moment in the United States of America, there are 2 million people sitting in prisons or jails. If you look at the rate of incarceration, we're at about 744 per 100,000. And to give you an idea of scale, uh, <clears throat> the other countries that we share that distinction with are Russia, Rwanda, El Salvador, and China. And we're considerably, we, we incarcerate at a considerably higher rate than those countries. Countries that we um, very frequently tag with uh, a lot of human rights abuses, but it's something that we do in this country regularly. Um, and who populates these prison cells? Typically people who look like me, black and brown people, people who speak Spanish, um, because we view drugs as a problem that we can incarcerate our way out of, as opposed to a public health challenge, people who need help, people who need addiction treatment, <clears throat> um, mental health care. Um, and that's one way that um, human rights abuse is manifest in our country every single day. And we don't think about it. We just think about, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people think these are just bad people who are getting put away because we have this simplistic view of, of crime, not as systemic and societal failures, but bad people who need to get put away and then the problem solved. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I always go back to that story about um, be careful what car you get into, because it's it's pretty alarming that um, someone somebody who whose first language is not English, someone who follows the news, yes, but um, is by no means an expert in criminal law, but she knew what criminal conspiracy was. Um, in TV shows or my friends criminal procedure is something that's known, something that's openly discussed. Why? Because something that we're proximate to. Um, incarceration is so close to our doors. Um, we don't view this as a human rights abuse, but it is because there may be a lot of complexity and laws put to it, but honestly, if you're black and brown, you're just seen as more criminal. Um, and, and I shared this at our, um, annual meeting last year, but, um, for the longest time, I had been conditioned to view black and brown skin as more criminal in, in, in just growing up. Um, when you, when you combine the colorism of the Dominican Republic with the deep, centuries old racism of American society, um, you kind of want to retreat from that. You don't want to identify with that. And I know a lot of other Dominicans who retreat from identifying as Black because of that, because of what American society feeds us and America's most wanted and the nightly news. And, and it's just over and over images of Black not being beautiful, Black being less than um, something to be feared, something as more dangerous. Um, it took me years, um, honestly, decades to <clears throat> remove this conditioning. Um, but it's, it's, it's the foundation of so many human rights abuses that this country commits every single day that so many of us don't question, don't think about much. Um, 
another way that it that that it manifests itself is um to keep people safe in prison very regularly, they'll be put in solitary confinement. And that that is torture. Um separation from human interaction, human contact is incredibly damaging to the brain. And if if you are trans, if you don't belong to the right gang, if you um have are are facing the threat of harm as opposed to shortening your 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 prison sentence, you're put in solitary confinement. That's another human rights abuse. Um and going back for a second to um how we try to incarcerate our way out of out of out of addiction um nearly 50 percent of people who are in federal prison are in there for drugs nearly a third are in there for their first offense federal prison for their first offense um <clears throat> we we use incarceration as this panacea that's going to solve all the problems in our in our society as opposed to actually going to root causes which is outside the scope of my talk but as as, as opposed to going to root causes education housing mental health care access to medical treatment we just incarcerate our way out of it then this is a human rights abuse uh we just <clears throat> don't view it as such uh we have uh, this fallacy that we are this perfect society and problems exist somewhere else far away when they're at our back door. And it's and it's really, really unfortunate. Now, um, I, I did want to go over some of the ways that my work at FCNL seeks to address um, these abuses that American society um, imposes on largely Black and brown people every single day. Um, in 2018, we passed the First Step Act, uh, and it essentially and it based, and, it, and it freed nearly four thousand about three thousand people from federal prisons, and it um, reduced the weight of criminal sentences for people who um, are charged with drugs drug felonies. Um, so many many people who are. Are not going to prison because of this law, or are going to prison for less time. Um, it improved conditions and, and services given um, in prisons, in addition to reauthorizing um, the Second Chance Reauthorization Act, which um, uh, which funds a lot of programs across the country um, to help individuals who are returning from a period of incarceration. Um, a lot of what the federal government does, um, if it's not tax policy, not taxing or giving tax credits, it's grants. Um, that's uh, that's a lot of how the government tries to go outside of its scope of just the federal system by impacting people in states across the country. So <clears throat> the second chance, the second chance, the second the second chance act um, authorizes grant programs that fund organizations across the country from affordable housing, mental health care, addiction treatment, um, vital, vital services for, for anyone who's in a very vulnerable position coming out of um, prison. Prisons or jails, actually, actually, not just the federal system, but the state system as well. Um, so it's national. Um, around that same time, <clears throat> as part of a coalition, um, well, the first step act that was also part of part part of the coalition that passed that bill, but um, behind closed doors, we were part of a coalition that um, passed a real act. This bill, this ban, this lifted the ban on um, Pell grants for people who are incarcerated. Um, this is just another way in the '90s that we just thought people who go to prison, people who do bad things. People who, who who have a criminal conviction are just bad people. They need to be punished endlessly. Um, and we were really fortunate to be able to, um, through this really complicated process and appropriations, because appropriations doesn't really make policy. It just funds government. We created policy in appropriations permanently 
to lift um, in 2018 the ban on 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 people receiving power grants in prisons. Um, we <clears throat> are along the same lines. We're looking to try to lift the bans on SNAP and TANF for people with drug felony convictions. Um, there are just so many ways that our society thinks that we can punish you into the ground and we can eliminate societal ills um, as opposed to seeing people as human beings. So we're looking to try to lift the ban <clears throat> on um, people receiving SNAP and TANF if you have a drug felony conviction. So this is really complicated and makes no sense, but you can lift the ban legislatively in states, not administratively. So you need a piece of legislation to pass through the state house to lift these bans. Um, that's why it's a patchwork. So there are states that have lifted the ban on SNAP, but not TANF, vice versa, lift the ban on TANF, but not SNAP, or you need to go through certain programs to be able to get SNAP. Um, it's, it's just really, really inhumane how if you have been convicted of having a problem, you have a problem, you have a health problem, you're using drugs, we're going to deny you food. That's this country. Um, and it's a human rights abuse. Um, we're denying people who need help, help. Um, <clears throat> so that's something else that we're working on. Um, and you might be thinking cash assistance and food, there's actually job training, child care, um, other referrals that come with having SNAP and TANF that could really be helpful to people who have addiction. Um, but they can't get it because we think that they are people who are worthy of shame, who are worthy of as much punishment as possible. And they're somehow going to do better if we try to take every rung out of that ladder, <clears throat> which is really unfortunate. Um, and outside of the scope of this talk, but there's an enormous sum of money in politics. Um, and um, I, I, I think back to my time in the private sector, how we built relationships and um, we had PACs, we had money that we gave out to politicians. We were in, in, in rooms with politicians, people who are low, who are who are lower and and middle income, this is not their world. They're not out here making donations. Um, people who are really engaged might make a twenty five fifty dollars donation to a candidate they really believe in, but two three thousand five thousand dollars checks are normal for regular people. Um, so people who need the most help are so often the furthest removed from that power to be able to make that change. Um, so just wanted to include that part in there because I think campaign finance is everything. Um, it, it, it touches on every single issue in our politics <clears throat> because it's how people in power get there. Um, now, I did want to touch on um, an issue that I was fortunate to spearhead when I when I was a fellow at the American Friends Service Committee. Um, it, I, I sparked up a friendship with um, somebody who, who whose parents were born in Haiti. Um, and, and we just started talking on Twitter, just going back and forth on a tweet. And I reached out and uh, she uh, was instrumental with her friends. Um, starting up a coalition of <clears throat> Haitians and Dominicans to try to get uh, the issue of statelessness uh, brought to the minds of legislators. Um, because, and just to give uh, a rough background, because this is something that I started all, kind of on the side, um, not really something established that the AFSC was really working on. Um, and <clears throat> there was, well, can't, can't go there. Let me let me go back to where it all started. Um, the the dictatorship that my that my grand that my grandmother fled with my mother at different times um, 
really enjoyed free or cheap labor. So in the early part of the 19th of the 20th century, the borders were open and Haitians were welcomed in. They were able to, they were able to make a living working on the sugarcane fields and start families and 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 eventually stay. Um and um they started families, they had children, and those children were essentially Dominican. They didn't know any other country. They were raised there, they went to school there. Um and this immigration continued uh, because it was never really um stopped. It was a part of life, they needed the labor. Um but <clears throat> Rujillo needed a scapegoat. Essentially, he was he 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 contrived the story that um, Haitians were stealing cattle, and he said that he was going to crack down on it. Um, and then eventually, what happened was um, he instituted the Parsley massacre. Um, because so many Dominicans are black. They look like me. They look darker than me. Uh, there's some Dominicans who look, who look like Joe Biden. So we we kind of span the gamut. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to tell who is Dominican and, and, and who is either Haitian or of, of Haitian descendants. Um, so what they devised was a task that was called... Um, um, they 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 asked pronounce parsley uh, because of the way the R hits in Creole and French is at the back of the mouth and perejil the R is at the front of the mouth so it's hard to say if you are a, a native Creole speaker so somebody who is a Creole speaker will probably pronounce it like perejil because that R is hard rolling that R at the front of the mouth is hard. Is, is, is hard. Um, and and essentially they were massacred, they were killed. Um, if you didn't pronounce it correctly, you were Haitian. And so something along the lines of it, it's it th there isn't good record keeping, but something along the lines of thirty thousand um, Haitians and Dominicans of Haitian descent were killed in um, the thirties. Um, and it was essentially colorism. It was essentially a mixture of colorism and xenophobia. Um, fast forward to I believe 2013 there was uh, a Supreme Court case that um, basically said if you don't have at least one parent that's born Dominican and you don't have other documents. I'm not sure exactly um, the contents of the case, but basically, <clears throat> um, they made uh, they made the decision retroactive until like the 30s, which is which was unheard of for a decision to be that far retroactive. So, essentially, it created this problem of statelessness where um, you needed to get documents to be able to be identified by the state as being Dominican. Um, many said that we have a solution and we can stop this illegal immigration of Haitians across the border. And uh, um, <clears throat> it's easy. You just get registered on this list, you get documents, um, and then you get your birth certificate and everything is fixed. You're fine. You're Dominican. If you say you were Dominican, you were Dominican. Um, what, 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 they didn't take into account was a lot of these people were poor. There was poor record keeping in a lot of these places. Um, and some people just didn't have documents. They didn't have <clears throat> a national ID card or a cellula. They didn't have a birth certificate. So it, it created this problem of people had no state. They didn't know Haiti, so they couldn't go back there, or it was just really dangerous or poor. Um, and 
the Dominican state didn't recognize them. Um, I'm a little bit shaky on the problem in Haiti because I think that um, there were there were issues in people getting Haitian citizenship as well, um, which I don't understand well. Um, but it just created a problem of statelessness, um, <clears throat> and 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 it was a really serious problem that's still going on today, uh, because um, the window of time to um, get on this list and get the documents you need, I think, closed. So now um, there are these Dominicans of Haitian descent who don't know where to call home because they don't have documents. They don't. They can't vote. They can't um, apply for services because you need an, a, a national ID card for anything. Um, so a lot of my work when I was at AFSC, this really was just like kind of a passion project. Um, I didn't even think I was supposed to do this because AFSC really doesn't work. AFSC does not do work where they do not have a presence. They have a presence in, in, in Guatemala, I believe, in Haiti, I believe, non-Dominican Republic. So um, this is really just kind of a passion project and I had some free time, so I did some work on that. Um, so that was really um, eye-opening to see um, the flaws in the culture where my parents come from. Um, because you can't really call it racism because it 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 doesn't have that same um it just the lines are very different here we have the one drop rule anything any amount of black you were black and so you have the weight of racism on you in the dominican republic is more so colorism it's how light your skin is the lighter you are the better you are um so it's it's a little different but it it, it operates pretty similarly um, and, it, and it really showed the deep cracks and flaws in the society that my parents come from. Um, and then just lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll close. Um, Jose? Yes. Just before we lose the thread of the statelessness, uh, the, what, what did you achieve by working on that issue at uh, AFSC? Were you able to uh, introduce reforms or other remedies? A lot of what I did was education. A lot of what I did was going into meetings. Um, <clears throat> we were really outmatched because I always knew and I always saw them. The 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 Dominican embassy was in there pro half the time, probably right after we got out of there, they're walking in there for a meeting. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of it was consciousness, consciousness raising, um, raising the issue. Um, very controversial person, but um, John Conyers of Michigan, he was uh, a big champion for Haiti. Um, so we 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 met with his office um, a bit. Um, the Black Caucus was was really sympathetic to that, to that issue. Um, so we, we really raised the issue. Um, but it was tough because it it wasn't seen as a priority issue. Raising the issue with with offices was tough because you're competing with so many other things. Um, we we had a lobby day, which was great to do with such a small operation. We had a lobby day with um, poets, writers, Dominican elected officials. Meaning, they are of Dominican descent, but they're elected here in the U.S. Um, so that was really really helpful in raising the issue. Unfortunately, we didn't solve it. Uh, we did our best, but um, we were we were essentially in a, a, an organization of volunteers. Um, but I was happy to do it, um, and 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 it unfortunately continues. It continues on. <clears throat> now, I I I was also going to touch upon some of my some of my peace building research. So this was really fascinating stuff. Um, I was working with um, then senior fellow Maria Stefan at the U U.S. Institute of Peace, and and I was doing research. Um, tried tried to do some of it in English, Spanish, and French, um, and basically what the goal of the research was to promote the the notion that nonviolent 
activism results achieves results that are much more enduring and um long lasting than change achieved through violent means a coup um attacking officials um nonviolent peaceful resistance is much more effective in the long run um and i i said that i don't, I don't remember a lot of it because it's been years now but um i did i I did research in Tunisia, research into Egypt, um, and then I was just essentially compiling coverage and research uh, for her second book, um, <clears throat> looking at that, um, and and it's and I and I found that to be the case. Um, nonviolent action is much more um, enduring and lasts longer um, because it's 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 easier to access that kind of activism, you get more people who, who rally your cause. Um, it's much more impressive to get a lot more people than less people and violence is, is, is much harder to get people in, in, engage in that kind of change, engage in that kind of activity. Um, so yeah, it was, it was just um, really interesting. And um, it's, it's proven by research that nonviolent action is, is much better than engaging in violence. And with that, I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, thank you, Jose. It's really interesting. In the last few days, even, I've been encountering more information about Haiti and the Dominican Republic from things that I'm reading and people I meet, and that now you. It was really, really good. Um, I would like to see hands. I'll take your hands, especially if you go to participants and um, if you click on your name, it should come up that um, raise hands. And it would help if I, okay. I've called on you, Steve, already, so, or didn't call on you, but heard anybody else? Okay, then Steve. Thank you, Jose, so much. Just on your last point, I think Anthony is the one who first brought Erica Chenoweth to our attention. Um, it was with her, yeah. Is that the work you referred to? Yes. Right. Uh, people should still read her 2011 book, while Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. Very persuasive, cross-cultural, cross-national research. <coughs> and uh, Jose, you should, we want you to know that uh, Jim Lawson was one of the founders of our organization and Reverend Jim Lawson taught a nonviolent resistance to Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Dr. King credits Jim with that uh, because of uh, uh, Jim's research in India and his own personal experiences of, uh, in Memphis and Vanderbilt and elsewhere. So we have a deep vein of commitment to nonviolent um, change. And uh, I just to make this into a question, uh, and I see other hands now, uh, wanted to ask at, at some point, and this could come a little later in your presentation, but are there current initiatives in justice? I understand you're the director of justice reform, uh, and we are a very activist group, and we represent other organizations as a kind of coalition of groups, and we'd love to know some of the initiatives or the current justice reforms you're working on and how we can help. Yeah, so <clears throat> my top issue is not something that I touched on um, because it's technically not criminal legal system reform. It falls more under the um, under the umbrella of gun violence prevention. 
um it's 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 uh I, I, it's 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 a new scope of work that i developed in my portfolio um we do work <clears throat> to try to gain federal funding for violence interrupters these are people who usually have a criminal conviction and because of that they are experts they go back out to the community they canvas they talk to people and they know when conflict is going to happen and they can intercede stop it before it turns violent or deadly um, they need funding oh. it's it's a relatively new initiative um so uh if you can um reach out to your members of congress and i know it's going to be a lot a lot of words but uh if if you can ask them to dedicate federal fund, dedicate 20 million dollars in federal funds for violence interrupters in the community violence intervention initiative um you could say cvi uh for short um so that's my top focus right now and it's and it's what's most likely to move because appropriations has to happen every year um so that's 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 really my top issue um, so you can say please dedicate 20 million dollars in federal funding for violence interrupters in the community violence intervention appropriations bill or in appropriations because that's not really a bill but that's a program and a bill all right thank you anthony well, uh, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you. What could we do here and now? Um, and that was a great response. I found that really interesting. I also appreciated what you said about the Dominican Republic. Uh, I'm just, uh, it's just shocking to hear that uh, so many people died in the past because of mispronouncing a word uh, as well as their background. Um, but is there anything that we could do today um, to help the stateless uh, people in the Dominican Republic? Unfortunately, I don't know. Um, I've, I've been pretty far removed from that work. Um, Yeah, even when I when I went to the Dominican Republic in 2018, I think I direct messaged somebody on Twitter who 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 headed up an organization um, doing the work, and I couldn't find the message. So I can only um, assume that they've gone under after COVID. Um, so yeah, I I'm, I wish I had a good answer for you. I'm sorry that I don't. Thank you. Sophia? Sophia, are you unmute? I was listening and um, in dealing with the, the migration patterns of people, regardless of, you know, you, you know, we'll look at their phenotype, but just, I was also following the situation in, in the Dominican Republic and even in Central and South America. So in Spanish, le decimos, there's always a threat of paracaidistas, alien imperialismo, and CIA, you know, <laughs> movements and just <laughs> golpe de estado. When you when and they use people, whether it be farm workers or anything, to go and encroach, and then there's a backlash to protect sovereignty um, because of these, you know, types of covert operations that nation states and colonial powers do all across the continent. And so I'm always very careful because we have we're humanitarians and people shouldn't be, you know, murdered because of other people's agendas. And because they're trying to protect their sovereignty, they shouldn't mistreat people and violate their human rights. But there is that. Uh, and it's happening all up and down the continent. And, and so I just wanted to add that um, comment, um, because I think that those we have to look at it at all angles. And I just wanted to share my thoughts. Gracias. Thank you. All right. Um, I wanted to say, Jose, that um, 
I I don't know if you have used the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in your work because there are so many of those 30 um, resolutions in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that the US was really partially um, the promoter of because Eleanor Roosevelt was the head of the committee that created it, but it deals with statelessness, the right to have a, um, a, a country that's recognized as you. It deals with racism in so many different ways. It deals with um, in unfair trials. It deals with so many of the issues. And I think it's really good to be able to do the work of, and to say, hey, this is a document that the US assigned, in fact, promoted and it's being violated in the United States. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at that. Um, in, in, it, I think it's tough because um, we benefit from the current position because if things are cheap, we get things cheap and we got a lot of sugar from the Dominican Republic. And 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 we, just like here in the U.S., we benefit from a permanent underclass. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> when the morals that we say we live by clash with our pocketbook, usually the pocketbook is going to win. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's one of the problems that I found. Um, we we're up against some pretty strong moneyed interests. Um, and, and, and we were a strong, small, but mighty bunch of volunteers. So it was, it was, it was tough, um, to, that was part of why it was tough to move the needle. Yeah, definitely. That's why I think using the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is just one more tool. It also deals with the right to immigrate to another country if your human rights are not being respected in the country that you are and security and the right to not live in poverty are also included in there. So um, it's, it's a tool. Steve, your hand up again, or did you just not take it down? You want a third go at it? I, I, I will until, and I'll always give way to anybody else. Uh, Jose, I put in the chat, uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance page from the Department of Justice program on community violence uh, intervention. Uh, and I thank you for drawing our attention to that uh, and others can go there. I was impressed throughout your talk of the, of the existence of programs on the books uh, such as the First Step Act and the Second Chance Act, Real Act, and this uh, uh, community violence intervention. In other words, by and large, there are programs they uh, in existence, but they need funding. And I found that the one of the tactics of conservatives is sometimes not to attack a program, but simply to starve it. Uh, and to deny funding um, and uh, complain that, that we don't have enough money and we shouldn't raise taxes. Now, the uh, First Step Act and the Second uh, Chance Acts uh, were enacted or, or invigorated during the Trump administration uh, in 2018. So I, I wanted to ask you, how did that come about that you that uh, uh, FCNL and your partners got bipartisan support for these uh, initiatives? Uh, what kinds of arguments worked? And I'm really thinking of talking points for us when we address these issues to combat the law and order mentality and replace it 
uh, with a public safety mentality. So uh, we have a little bit of time so you can expand uh, on your thoughts in this regard and, and help us understand the best talking points and arguments in favor of funding these programs. And from your observation, uh, how were you able to get the Trump administration and uh, Republicans to support these programs? So I'll take it backwards. I'll I'll take it with how we're addressing that now because we have to be partisan because we're we're in we're in a position of uh, divided government. So language is really important. Um, we're do, we're working with a friend in Washington who's doing our 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 more legacy gun violence prevention work, like like mass shootings and um, banning AR fifteens. Um, Things like gun safety is not going to ring well with Republicans. You have to say uh, gun security, like you're keeping guns secure so that kids can't get to them and hurt themselves. Like that's just one example of how language is important. <clears throat> We're dealing with this nonsense about being afraid of being woke. So um, I, I probably will not be making comments about racial justice um, and how urban gun violence generally tends to affect black and brown people. I don't make a lot of mention of that, but what I will say is that um, we're putting way too much strain on police. Um, police have been seeing an increase in their budget for over four decades now, and violent crime has been coming up. We need another solution, um, and this keeps cops safe because they're not dealing with the effects of violence in communities. Uh, mm -hmm. Language is so key. Um, you have to speak to what resonates with who you're speaking to. Now, uh, to, to, to your original point about how we did it during the Trump administration, honestly, a lot of stars aligned. Um, we were using the success of Texas, South Carolina, Georgia, having passed similar reforms under Republican administrations. Texas saw that, um, saw that uh, in Texas, you were going to see a need for X amount of new prison beds, and it was going to cost X billions of dollars over 10 years. They said, this is ridiculous. We're not going to do this. So they didn't build that prison. They reduced incarceration. They instituted new lower criminal sentences for drug for, for drug felonies. And what happened was incarceration went down and crime went down. So this belief that if you go, quote unquote, soft on crime, if you reduce sentences, things are going to get worse and people are going to. And and there's going to be more crime and more violence. That's not that just wasn't borne out by the facts. That didn't happen. So we had a bit of work that was done for, done for us in the states, and we brought that to the federal level, um, and we use that as as a big point of evidence. Like, look, it works, and it works. But Republicans did this, uh, and and there were people involved like for instance grassy was a chair of the judiciary committee in the senate and he will he would not take anything that did not have sentence in reform because the first step back started out as prison reform um and he said if you don't if you don't reduce criminal sentences you're not going to pass this bill in my committee and that's because we had done work as a faith community in iowa uh we blanketed iowa years ago i think like in 2014 2013 yeah, 2014, 2013, we just blanketed Iowa and we got to Grassley and he became a believer. He went from tough on crime to really caring about this issue. Um, so yeah, it really was the, that that the stars aligned. Uh, we we were able to get to Trump's son-in-law who became an advocate for this. Not a strong one, but he, he did become an advocate for this and he got to Trump and uh, we got in a room, not me, but um, senators got into a room with Jared Kushner and Trump and he was like, yeah, sure, we'll do this. And it passed. That's great. And Sophia. Kim Kardashian? Yeah, she helped too. 
Um, I, I wanted just to mention about the First Step Act and, and the work we were doing, where just I was involved with some of the prison abolitionists. <clears throat> and although people really applauded it, a lot of people were upset because it, we were mobilizing and coordinating the largest prison strike in the nation's history. And the, the people, the men behind and those behind the wall, mostly men were upset because the issues of the hunger strike were sort of just blocked out because everyone was pushing the first step back. And then you look at WikiLeaks and you read the how BLM, how that was hijacked and how it was funded. Um, and once again, a lot of the men felt left behind. And so I'm still, I have some of my radar still listening in and, and participating and understanding what the movement is today um, and how, like I said, many individuals behind the wall were upset with the First Step Act because everything that they had sacrificed for, the torture, you know, the hunger strikes, the beatings, the killings that we don't see behind the wall got left behind because on the outside, there was no communication with the inside and some special interests, you know, always get involved when you're trying to do the right thing. And so I just wanted to add that to the conversation so that we don't forget what was going on and what's still going on behind the wall to, to seek those things. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I also add that it was not a perfect bill by any, by any stretch. Um, BLM really had a problem with it. One of the biggest problems, actually also um, Just Leadership, which is an uh, organization led by people who were formerly incarcerated they had they had some serious problems with it um they 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 right rightly said that it would have it, it it represents a large expansion of incarceration so a lot of probation electronic monitoring um part of what they did with letting people out early is put them under supervision and sometimes supervision can be really heavy to deal with and it can be an easy way to end up right back in prison because you don't meet the terms of your of your probation. Um, and it can sometimes come down to the personality of your probation officer. Um, so it had some problems. It had some real problems. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll definitely share that um, it was not a perfect bill. Um, but yeah, um, or like a major yeah. major mother, leave your mother your warden, and then it, you give up your rights because they can go in on the search warrant. And you lose all your civil rights because you're housing someone. And so that's like recriminalizing a whole family if they go in. So those were just, you know, things to think about that have to be changed. Thanks. Yeah. All right. It is. Um, anybody else? Uh, could you? Jose, just one more thing. Could you speak on um, statelessness of other peoples throughout the world? And is there any movement to join those together? I, I can't speak to it too much. And I, I followed news about the Rohingya. Um, and... Uh, some of the Muslims in Western China. I don't know if that's statelessness. That might just be human rights violations. Um, I think because these countries are so different, you have to really know the country and the problems. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I just I just don't know enough to, to be able to tell you if there's any synergy between the different movements. Steve, okay, I see you're back. Uh, just in terms of resources, this story of taking, of highlighting Texas, South Carolina, Georgia, and uh, those, those efforts is our, uh, on the FCNL website, can we find resources and history and examples to use citing those state initiatives that were successful? Probably not, because the work that we do is federal, and that was all state-based legislation that was that that passed and moved. Um, but as you made the case for federal, I gather you were citing those state examples 
so I'm wondering if there were any white papers or research that cited these uh, uh, state examples. Uh, um, I mean, I probably could find it. I just don't have the resources handy because a lot of this was stuff that we talked about in coalition um, that came up with partners uh, doing this work. Sure. Um, well, we consider this uh, an ongoing relationship with you uh, and FCNL. So offline, whether it's through Anthony or uh, Rick Banyales, who you're in touch with, uh, if you have any direct, I mean, we can also do our own research, but if you have any direct linkage to some of your partners, I just think those examples are so productive and illuminating to, to be able to, because you hit a brick wall often, and instead someone was very effective in those states in bringing about those kinds of, of reforms. Uh, in terms of resources, my, my uh, other comment, I want to encourage people, uh, this is a book uh, which its title virtually tells uh, the whole story. Uh, it's by Ira Katznelson. Uh, this is the re-release with a new introduction. Uh, he wrote the book in uh, tw uh, 2006, documenting how uh, the GI Bill, Social Security, government programs were either written uh, to uh, favor uh, whites and uh, established elites coming out of World War II, uh, or uh, the Dixiecrats encouraged these laws, which were national programs, to be administered at a state level. And what you had then were was discrimination and redlining uh, Anthony has addressed some of this as well. And then how these programs were implemented, uh, perpetuated uh, white supremacy. Uh, the subtitle you might not be able to read on the screen, the untold story of racial inequality in 20th century America. Uh, I, I just found this book, I'm, I'm uh, gonna review it. Uh, so illuminating because of the factual information that shows uh, it, it's not that uh, uh, people are opposed to government programs. They just want the government programs that favor them. Uh, and they deny government programs that favor people of color and marginal groups. Um, so uh, in connection with everything you've said today, I'm just encouraging people, it's a paperback edition published by Liverite, uh, to track it down. Uh, the factual information has been updated. Uh, unfortunately, all the problems this author, author identified almost 10 years ago stretch back to the entire post-World War II period. Uh, and the use of government programs uh, to support white supremacy and to deny support in minority communities uh, exists to this very day. Thanks for letting me uh, put in that plug. Well, if we're doing book reports, I'm doing <laughs> um, uh, The Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines, and The Making and Breaking of America's Empire. It gets into Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and it's really fascinating. So, uh, so <clears throat> yeah, since, um, since Steve mentioned me in regards to uh, housing uh, and uh, racial injustice, I want to recommend uh, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, that documents how um, policies uh, at the federal and state and local level uh, regarding uh, mostly housing <clears throat> really has uh, segregated America. Uh, so it was not something that just happened, but it was deliberate policy. And uh, one of the things that um, 
my wife Jill and I have done as part of our work around racial justice and housing has been to create a game called the Unfair Housing Game, which we played here at ICUJP, and we use a lot in our work. <clears throat> it's kind of like Monopoly, only it's the real deal. <laughs> because Monopoly starts off with the assumption that everybody has the same amount of money and everybody plays by the same rules. But in our game, <clears throat> you're given a, a choice of being a black bean or white bean. And that determines how much money you start out with. You start out with 10 times more money if you're a white bean and you choose from a different stack of cards uh, if you are a white or a black bean that reflect the actual uh, policies uh, in our country regarding uh, housing and how uh, rigged they are in uh, racially speaking. So it's been a very interesting game. We played it with a lot of people and it certainly uh, opens people's eyes to the reality that uh, in housing as in many other areas, uh, our country has been profoundly racist uh, uh, and, uh, and that helps people to realize it in a, in a way that's uh, uh, well, you know, you play a game and people get very engaged. <laughs> and then we ask them afterwards, how do you feel? What did you learn? And it's been a great educational tool. We'd like to make it into a more professional game at this point. We just have it as a sort of, uh, you know, we haven't really marketed it, but that's that's what we, we're doing as part of our racial justice work. And uh, thank you. I want to say I put something in the chat that was also monitoring some of the immigration issues over in the border, uh, the Haitian community, all the communities, and the criminalization of the journalists. So I put it in the chat. It's a good read. I was just saying while I was on mute, um, really appreciate <laughs> you having me, and I uh, enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. All right. Um, are you, do you ever work with bad team? Maybe my colleague does, um, because they they uh, they work on immigration that's outside of my issue areas. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that my colleague Anika does. The Black Alliance for a just immigration. All right, Carol uh, Francis. Yeah. Oh, there's uh, Dave's hands up. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I uh, I I I just raised my hand. Um, it. Uh, and I, I just wanted to say it's been a very enlightening um, presentation. And I wanted uh, it, 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 many, well, some people here may remember that uh, Lyndon Johnson intervened militarily in the uh, polit internal politics of, uh, of uh, the Dominican Republic. And of course, the United States has a long, long history of intervention in Haiti. And I, I wanted to ask Jose, I, I heard a really informative and really detailed presentation uh, from you of the, of the issue. Uh, and I just wonder if you have any observations uh, to make about uh, the role of U.S. intervention in both countries over so many, uh, well, centuries. Yeah, I I know a good bit because this has been my life. So I I, I don't think that somebody who this doesn't touch your life, you would know as much about it. Um, like for instance. I was in school when Yugoslavia happened. I don't know much about it. It just wasn't my life. Um, so I just, I just think that it's, 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 it's hard to have that kind of grand, granular detail if you're not really, really enthusiastic and curious about it. If it's not your life. So what we've been doing at FCNL is, <clears throat> my colleagues on the foreign policy side, we make very clear that we spend an enormous amount of money on militarism and there's a lot of needs here at home and there's a lot of needs for helping build peace abroad that doesn't involve introducing guns into the mix. Um, that 
gets at a lot of these problems without necessarily going deep into any one particular country and our wrongs that we do in any one particular country. Um, so we kind of do this work broadly speaking, and it's easier to you know plug in and 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 become involved. Um, but yeah, each and every single one of these problems is entrenched, has a long history, and and you know you could you could fill up a whole semester and maybe start to understand half of it. Um, so I think I think the way that we approach it and kind of this wider view of um, this one tool is overused and doesn't work well, which is militarism. Let's use other tools like peace building, like um, capacity building, like uh, building entrepreneurship programs. Like those kinds of tools we should be building more of in our policies. As they say, if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, every problem is going to look like a nail. On the the problem, uh, the problems in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, uh, my my thought was, or my question was, do uh, does the inter? Uh, I, I I think. LBJ intervened in, in the Dominican Republic and maybe nullified an election. Maybe Steve Rohde would remember what happened there. But there was a military, it was during the Vietnam era, and LBJ intervened militarily in the Dominican Republic. And um and and I I just wondered if that if if there was uh if if that type of intervention and the intervention that was going on forever in Haiti, uh, did that intervention aggravate the situation that you've described? Did it improve it or did it have no impact? My sense is that it aggravated the problem. Anytime that you have foreign intervention, you're um, meddling in another country's affairs, you're um, interrupting the healthy process of them developing their their institutions because intervention usually is going to involve um installing people who are sensitive to that kind of, to in this case the us's interests uh and not be uh, sensitive to the people's interests um it's always very damaging um probably outside of my school tell you how damaging it is um it's not really the work that i do but um yeah ab absolutely not helpful not a good thing Thank you. That intervention was sending in the Marines, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the way I recall. And I don't know if he overthrew an election of a candidate that uh, that LBJ thought was undesirable. Uh, and and I, I was hoping that somebody else uh, could could tell us because it went way under the radar uh, in in the Vietnam era. Uh, it, it was a big event, but it was <coughs> I, it was quickly forgotten, and uh, the mainstream media didn't uh, didn't give it much attention. Uh, so I was hoping that somebody could um, remind us what that intervention was about. Uh, I, I don't I don't have the full details, but uh, my sense is that it was after Trujillo was killed. Um, and they installed um, either a high-level bureaucrat or the vice president, Joaquin Balaguer, who was um, just as bad, just a little more Christian. So um, he he had a veneer of, like, upstanding Dominican, uh, but he was still pretty bad. <clears throat> okay. Bill Oaks didn't let it go by. Uh, thank you, Jose, so much. Mm -hmm. Tremendous amount of information. But beyond that, your own personal passion, uh, your commitment to this work. Uh, I am uh, always inclined at this moment to say that you are a card carrying member of ICUJP. Please join us uh, whenever you can. We'll look to you for updates on the work that you're doing.